So tonight's speaker is Carl Johnson, who is an Anchorage, Alaska-based nature photographer. He does landscapes, wildlife, and lifestyles of the Arctic, as well as doing tours on photographing the Aurora Borealis. He's been an artist in residence in five national parks and was a category winner for the Wendland Smith Rice International Awards and has been published in several publications. He's an associate fellow with the International League of Conservation Photographers and a member of Nikon Professional Services. He leads tours and workshops through his company, Alaska Photo Treks. And we are lucky to get him here at the end of our pandemic uh, related Zoom talks. And so Carl, take it away. And you're on, you're muted, Carl. Will do. I'm going to go ahead and uh, start sharing my screen here. Play my presentation from the start. Uh, so thank you again for the opportunity to chat with you. Um, one of my artist residencies was at Rocky Mountain National Park. So uh, here are you guys talking about skiing still. And uh, here at, at sea level, uh, Kind of our skiing season is pretty much done. <laughs> you have to get up into the higher elevations in order to still do some skiing around here. But uh, thanks for joining me and thanks for listening in. So I, I title this Nocturnal Obsession because really once you get into chasing and photographing the Northern Lights, it really does kind of become its own obsession. It's a good one though. Uh, I, I particularly enjoy it. And um, not just for the photographic aspects of it, but there's just something about being out in the middle of nowhere, in the dark, in the quiet, and waiting for and watching and photographing the northern lights, and you get to see shooting stars and hear owls hooting and, and coyote packs yipping in the background. Uh, it's just kind of brings together a lot of things why, why we're into nature photography in the first place, and it gives us something extra special, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. So what is the aurora? Um, now. Over time, we've tried to figure this out as humans. What, what is the Northern Lights? Now, of course, you know, before we had science, we had beliefs and legends and myths that kind of taught us, you know, what, what the Northern Lights were, at least explain them before we could really understand them from a scientific standpoint. So, most of the beliefs, the consistent beliefs, come from people living in the far north, of course, because they're the ones who, who see them a lot. You'll find across the spectrum from Greenland over to the Bering Sea coast in, in Alaska that the native people of the far north in North America have had a lot of different beliefs over the years. But consistently, it's the belief that they are spirits of ancestors, uh, spirits of certain animals, um, in a bizarre twist. In one case, it's walrus playing with the head of a human as a ball, like playing a ball game. And the flip of that, there's one Inuit belief where it's humans playing with the head of a walrus as a ball, like a ball game. I'm not sure how that happens. But um, one of my stories that I was told when I was in Antarctic Pass, which is a central Brooks Range Arctic uh, native community here in Alaska, they, they tell their kids when it's cold outside, they better wear their hat or the aurora will chop off their head and play with it like a ball. So again, there's that whole using a head as a ball in, in a game thing. I don't know how that gets started, but it's fascinating. Now, of course, um, it's not just the indigenous people of the far north, but the Vikings also had their share of legends about what the Northern Lights were. Uh, some writings refer to... Um, the light flashing off of the armory of the Valkyries as sparking lights in the sky. And another legend points to the Bifrost, the rainbow bridge that carries, that's the connection between Asgard, the, the realm of the gods, and Midgard, the realm, the realm of mortals. So um, again, and when I look at pictures like this, I could see how this connection, this rainbow bridge idea was created 
to explain the northern lights in the sky because it, it looks just like that. And if you've seen the Marvel movies or how they depict Asgard and the Rainbow Bridge, it's got those colors of the aurora kind of flickering back and forth. So it's kind of cool. Uh, but we've known uh, in recent hundred years a bit more about the science of the aurora borealis. Now it was um, in Galileo in 1619 who came up with the term aurora borealis, aurora from the Roman goddess of the dawn and borealis from the Greek word for the northern wind. So here's kind of a quick diagram of what we understand causes the northern lights. It all starts with solar activity. Now, on any given night when you're far enough north, there's enough solar activity that will create the northern lights in some way. If you've got dark, clear skies and you're well above the Arctic Circle, you might see the northern lights on any night. It might just be a dim glow on the horizon. It might be something more active. But what we're looking for, when we're looking for great northern lights displays to photograph and that are worth traveling you know, halfway across the world to see, we're looking for two particular things. One, what's called a coronal hole, which is a large dark mass in the sun. Uh, unlike the sunspots, which are just like little specks compared to a coronal hole. A coronal hole releases a continuous stream. It's called a coronal hole high-speed stream out into space. And this is releasing plasma out of the sun. And these can be active for months or even years. So it takes about 28 days for the sun to rotate around. If that coronal hole is active again, still that 28 days later, you can get another several days, two, three, sometimes even four nights in a row of good Northern Lights activity. The other thing we look for is a one-time burst of plasma. It starts with a solar flare that snaps off and releases a big chunk of plasma out in a space called a coronal mass ejection. And again, that's just a one-time shot. Uh, November 3rd, there was a huge coronal mass ejection that left and created one of the most powerful aurora events I've seen in years, uh, at least up here. But it was a one-time thing. You know, we couldn't rely on that to happen next month, and it, it was good for one night, and then that was it. Either way, uh, that energy, that solar stream, or that coronal mass ejection, the CME, ride the solar winds towards Earth. Now, the solar winds travel at a variety of speeds, anywhere from high 200 kilometers per second to up to six and 700 kilometers per second. Those solar winds carry with them the magnetic charge of the sun that's released when that energy, that plasma is released from the sun. That's called the interplanetary magnetic field. So that interplanetary magnetic field interacts with our magnetic field. And typically what will happen is that plasma will interact with the lines that create our magnetosphere, the the magnetic lines that come out of our north and south magnetic poles. And they'll energize those lines and they'll come down. And if we're lucky, we'll get cracks in our magnetosphere that allow that those energized particles to penetrate and interact with either oxygen or nitrogen in our atmosphere. That's kind of the quick explanation of what causes the northern lights. Now, I'll get a little bit later into forecasting and kind of what data we're looking for that, that creates a good northern lights display but that's the long and short of it. Now, when those charged particles interact with oxygen or nitrogen in our atmosphere, they're gonna produce different colors. <laughs> what color depends on the altitude and the element they're interacting with. So oxygen will produce green aurora up to about 150 miles, and then red aurora above that. Nitrogen produces blue aurora up to about 60 miles, and then purple aurora above that. Now, when we get a really good storm, we're going to see colors all across the spectrum. We'll see whites, yellows, pinks, magentas, purples. Some folks have even been starting to photograph orange in their aurora lately, which is kind of a new thing. Now, the key is, and this is where photographing the northern lights as part of chasing it becomes really the best way to experience the northern lights, a lot of these colors are not visible to the naked eye because the rods in our eyes that transmit data to our brain that is interpreted as color, they don't pick up color in darkly lit conditions. So if you're out with uh, like less than 50% moon illumination or a new moon, it's really dark, 
everything looks grayscale. You don't perceive color unless you have a bright light. So when we first see the aurora on the horizon, it might just be it look like a pale gray. But when I take a picture of it, it'll be a nice vivid green. And as it gets more active, we might see it now. It'll get brighter. We'll see the green with our eye. But then we take pictures, we might look at it and go, oh, there's some purple in there, or there's some pinks or some reds. So the best way to really perceive all of the available colors is to photograph the northern lights. And then the main reason for why I figured this out, I, I always thought it was the sensor and the camera that allowed the camera to perceive the color better, but it's actually the long ex exposure specifically. And this, this Eureka moment came to me last year. I had three cameras set up one night. I was up in the Brooks Range, which is our northernmost mountain range here in Alaska. I had three cameras going, two were shooting video because I was field testing a Sony Alpha 7 S2 with a Nikon Z62 to see if the Nikons were getting to have as good a quality as the Alpha 7 S series with the Sony's. They're not for low light video. And then I had a still camera going. And the still camera was picking up this crazy magenta color that the videos were not. And that's because they were shooting at a frame rate of, you know, 30 frames a second. So it's a long exposure, though. It brings out the colors. So one of the um, other fun things about photographing and chasing the aurora is that you get to see a lot of cool shapes and forms that relate to uh, the northern lights, you know, going through different stages of either a geomagnetic storm or different activities from quiet to moderate to active. So the first one is arcs. These tend to occur early in an aurora display. They're relatively stable, such that, you know, this is a, I'm trying to remember, this is a five image stitch panoramic. So they stay stable enough where I can take you know, five 15 second exposures separately and then stitch them together to create this panoramic. They might have a little bit of movement in them, but generally they're pretty stable and they're kind of the beginning of the show, more or less. Then as it gets more active, that arc will break up and bend and twist and form what are called bands. Now they can be kind of diffuse or more defined with very specific shapes and textures to them. They can move slowly, uh, and this is also the sometimes nicknamed curtains because they kind of look like, you know, curtains moving in a gentle breeze, or they can act really, really quickly. They can move around pretty quickly. And uh, I'll get into a little bit later about photographing them and how you have to adjust <clears throat> when the aurora is switch switching from kind of slower to faster movement. So pillars... I've seen pillars at all levels of activity. I've seen pillars when the aurora is relatively quiet, and I've seen it when it's really active. Now, of course, when it's more quiet, you might have one or two isolated pillars. And then if it's really active, the whole sky fills up with them, like, like in this photo here. Now, the key thing to note about pillars, uh, aurora chasers often call them spikes. And I'll get into a, a little bit later here why the, the, the penchant for aurora chasers to come up with their own names that the scientists don't use. Uh, pillars run to about 100 kilometers in height, and they're about a kilometer wide. Just kind of give you a sense of scale of what you're, what you're looking at in this photo. And then this is kind of the considered the quintessential aurora formation to see, photograph, and experience, the corona. Basically, it's a directly overhead display. That, that pillar we were seeing a couple of photos ago, you're directly underneath the pillars looking up. You're looking at the, basically the center or the zenith of the heart of the aurora activity. It's all right there directly above you. Now, again, when it comes to composition, you know, generally I like to have some kind of foreground, but sometimes you, you can only just shoot straight up depending where you're at. If you're more flat location, if you want to get that corona, you just got to shoot straight up. And coronas tend to move very rapidly. So you have to adjust your exposure to, to compensate for that. Now, sometimes pillars or uh, coronas are situated to where you can include some type of foreground in them. So when that is possible, I like to do that. And coronas come in all kinds of shapes and sizes. 
it's typically when I'm getting a Corona display, when I bemoan the fact that my widest millimeter I have available is 14 millimeters. That's when I just go, oh, once in a while, it'd be nice to have a 10 millimeter for a shot like this. Interestingly though, uh, Coronas often take on the shape of birds. Uh, like this last one here has kind of a bird-like neck and a beak and big wings. This one here looks kind of like a raptor of some sort flying overhead. Uh, so aurora viewing also can sometimes be like cloud viewing where you're kind of like, ooh, that looks like the shape of a such and such. You see all kinds of funky shapes in the aurora. And then another type of aurora that doesn't happen as frequently, although we've been seeing them a lot lately, is what's called a pulsating aurora. Now, it's when you're looking at the sky You'll see these kind of flashes, blotches here and there, just kind of on, off, on, off, or sometimes these waves of light just kind of shimmering overhead. It's hard to photograph to get a sense of the that what the pulsating aurora really does. So I found that doing time lapse is really the best way to get a sense of the movement and the activity of a pulsating aurora. But pulsating aurora are, are produced by what are called chorus waves when there are shifts in currents of charged particles that cause electrons to scatter in the atmosphere. And these changes, these are, are thought to be caused by changes in the magnetic field. And the magnetic field can sometimes fluctuate quite a bit. So that's one of the reasons why they, they think that um, what produces pulsating aurora. And then there's Steve. All right, say hi to Steve, everybody. So Steve, um, what we now know is Steve, was originally called a proton arc. It usually happens separate from the main aurora display. Like maybe you've got some aurora on the north that's kind of diffuse and just kind of hanging there and not really active. But then there was this bright light pink band that would go straight overhead from east to west, separate from the aurora. So Northern Lights chasers just started calling it a proton arc. And scientists are like, no, 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 no. It can't be anything proton related because protons aren't visible to the naked eye. This phenomenon is visible to the naked eye. So um, that's not the correct name for it. And then some aurora chasers in Canada said, okay, fine. We're going to call it Steve. And again, the scientists are like, no, just stop making stuff up, please. Um, and they studied this phenomenon for a while. They've determined two things. First of all, it's not the Northern Lights. It's some other type of charged particle gaseous behavior, but that also they determined that it's really hot. It puts on a lot of heat. So they came up with a name for it that corresponds to what they studied about its, its features. So it's called a strong thermal emission velocity enhancement. Yeah, you got it, Steve. Uh, so. It's now officially Steve, although it's got a scientific name behind it. And here's another view of Steve. So again, you've got kind of a diffuse aurora just kind of hanging out there on the northern horizon. And then this separate phenomenon occurring. Now again, this is, this is with a 14 millimeter. So this is going up and overhead and behind and to the left on the west. But people get really excited when they see Steve. Okay, so when can we see the aurora? Again, if you're far enough north, you can see it almost every night. But let's talk a little bit about the solar cycle because again, the, the best sorts of Northern Lights displays are caused by solar activity. And let's talk a little bit about the solar cycle. Now, roughly the sun goes through an 11 year cycle. It'll start at a solar minimum goes up to a maximum and down to a minimum. And over time, going back to the early 1700s, these are the charts of the solar minimums and maximums over time. And as you can see, even the maximums themselves have highs and lows. They kind of go through these waves where they go up and down and up and down. Right now we are in solar cycle, let me let me explain this a little bit further. So when you see these dips here, what they're charting is sunspot activity. So we the two things that really signal the beginning of a new solar cycle are one, 
long periods of time when we don't have any sunspots visible on the sun. So that's minimum activity, so solar minimum. And the other one, the sun's magnetic polarity actually flips. When those two things occur, when we have that long period of time with no sunspots and they register that change in the magnetic polarity, boom, we start a new solar cycle. Now, these are the last three solar cycles. The last solar maximum peaked at around 2014. And then the last solar minimums right here at the end was December of 2019, actually. And you can see for the last three solar maximums, the maximum level has gone down a little bit. So we're in that kind of downward trend over the last three solar cycles. But here we are now in solar cycle 25. And what they've been seeing is an uptick, a higher than expected level of sunspot activity. So they are thinking that we are going to be heading towards a solar maximum that's much more like the one here on solar cycle 23. It's going to be a higher level of activity than our last solar cycle. So right now, we're working our way up to a solar maximum in 2025. That's the estimate, somewhere around July. So the next three years are going to be increasingly getting better and better and better for viewing the Northern Lights. So that's kind of one way to look at when is a good time to be going out and looking for the Northern Lights. Now, the other, th other time, we uh, other thing we look at is there are specific times within each year that are best to see the Northern Lights. And particularly, they studied, they studied um, Aurora Borealis activity over a 70 year, 75 year period. And they looked at two factors for each month. One, how many days in that month was there a geomagnetic storm? And how many days in that month was the KP level above three? And I'll explain what the KP level is here in a little bit. And based on that, they concluded that the aurora is most active around the fall and spring equinox. And then they specifically identify the months where it is most active. And that is from starting with March and then April and February, and then September, October, and August. Those are the busiest months. And then the lowest months for, uh, sun, for uh, aurora activity are December, January, and then June, July. But you can photograph and, and see as long as it's dark, aurora displays and just about any time of the year. For example, here's a shot in, actually, I can't remember if this is December or early January, but either way, uh, Christmas lights are on. This is my front yard in our house in Southside Anchorage. And um, there it is. There's the Northern Lights. It's about 6.30 in the morning. I was getting out to go take out the trash because <laughs> it was trash day. And boom, there were the Northern Lights. In fact, um, this last December for our Northern Lights tour, we had 100% success. Every night we went out uh, to see the Northern Lights, we saw them on our tour. The big issue is the level of activity. And March and April, I just have much more active Northern Lights displays compared to those times. The other factor, of course, is daylight. Uh, there's a reason why we, we shut down our Aurora tours here coming soon, actually, in the next two weeks. And because we get to a certain point where the sky is simply too bright to see the Northern Lights. Now, this is the latest I've ever photographed the Northern Lights near Anchorage. This was May 13th. This was a KP7 geomagnetic storm. This was a very active, bright Northern Lights. But at this time of year, um, I don't even think we even have, we have some nautical, yeah, I can see we have some nautical twilight, but not very long. It was like maybe half an hour of nautical twilight at most. And then you get to late May and there's just nothing, nothing but civil twilight. And then once we get into June, we don't even have civil twilight. So, how far north you go also affects because the farther north you go, the brighter the skies are. But you can have later season auroras the farther south you are. I photographed them down in Juneau around Memorial Day weekend. And then I have a friend who lives in the North Shore of Minnesota who photographs them all summer. So, you know, if you've got dark skies and good active enough aurora for it to be as far south as the lower 48 in the northern states, then you can see the northern lights. Another factor is on, on when to go 
is the moon. Now, with a really active bright Northern Lights display, you can see it with a full moon, but it takes a really active Northern Lights display. There's a lot of light pollution that comes off of a, a full moon. So my preference is to go photograph with less than 50% illumination, but I also prefer to have some moon over a new moon because, you know, as you can see here, you, you get to have the landscape illuminated. I like to see the details in the landscape when I'm doing nighttime photography. If I want to just silhouettes, yeah, new moon is great. But if I want to see detail, then um, you might want to go with a little bit of moon. Another factor is snow. Now, if it's the snow on the ground during a new moon, the aurora can be bright enough to light up that snow and then light up the landscape. But if it's in the fall before the snow has fallen, then the landscape is really dark. You don't see any details. All right, so these are kind of general times, you know, over the solar cycle and which months are best. But, you know, what are the tools available if you want to plan a trip uh, and you want to determine whether or not you're going to get the chance to see the Northern Lights, when are you going to do it? Now, my suggestion would be first, plan a trip around those peak activities, uh, peak periods of activity, fall and spring equinox. Decide whether or not you want snow or not snow. And that helps you determine whether or not you want to go March, April, or you know, August, September, October. But once you've got your trip planned, now you need to know, okay, what are going to be the good times to go out when I'm there? I suggest giving yourself at least five nights at the location to give yourself plenty of opportunity. And then you want to figure out what are the good websites and apps that you can use to figure out when specifically you can go out to see the Northern Lights. Now, here's one. When people Google Northern Lights forecast for Alaska, this is the website they most often see. This is the University of Alaska Fairbanks Geophysical Institute's Aurora forecast page. Now, Geophysical Institute, that's what they do is they're studying the Northern Lights. So there are a few problems with this website. It's got the handy graphic where it displays the KP, and I'll get to that in a second. But they don't convert this, the forecast to here that's in the upper right-hand corner. They don't convert that to local time. They're getting their feed from the NOAA Space Weather Prediction Center, which does everything in Greenwich Mean Time. So people look at that and go, oh, it's going to be uh, KP5 at midnight. Yeah, that's midnight GMT, so you have to convert to Alaska time, which is 4 p.m., which is not a good time to see the Northern Lights. <laughs> so here is what I mentioned, the NOAA Space Weather Prediction Center. So National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the same folks who brought us the National Weather Service, they have a Space Weather Prediction Center. This is the source for all of the data, for all of the apps and all the websites everywhere out there where, that, are, that are putting out Aurora information and forecasts. It all comes from this source. So there's a lot of great scientific information here about the Northern Lights, the different aspects about the different types of formations, what causes them. It's a good website to become really familiar with. But you can also find some great tools on the front page. Here on the upper right hand, again, there's the estimated planetary key index. I'll explain that in a second. But on the bottom here, you can click under products and data, you've got forecasts and you can subscribe. What I subscribe to is just the, um, the three day forecast and the forecast discussion. And these come into your email inbox three times a day. So you get continuous updates on what's going on real time with the Northern Lights. That's another problem with this website. They don't update it. It's based on the 27 day outlook, which is predictive modeling. It's not real time data. So under products and data, I encourage you, if you wanna get into Northern Lights chasing, subscribe to those two forecasts. That'll be a great way to kind of be in touch or at least as you're getting ready to prepare for a trip, you're gonna be in touch with what's going on with the Northern Lights. Now, here's what the forecast looks like. It's broken down into three-hour increments. It gives the KP level estimated forecast for that time. 
And again, it's in Greenwich Mean Time, so you have to convert to your time zone. So for you guys, that would be minus six GMT. And also using that and several other sources we have on our website, uh, an Aurora forecast that's specific to Anchorage. We provide the conversion to local time on what the maximum KP level will be on the nights uh, during Alaska viewing time, which is now it's 11, uh, 11 p.m., not starting at 10 p.m. Um, it gives information about what the moon phase is, what the expected solar wind and geomagnetic field activities are, and also gives uh, weather forecasts for the area. But there are some apps that I think are worth checking out. First, the My Aurora Forecast app does a pretty good job. Um, it does suffer from some of the faults of some apps where I sometimes question the algorithm they use to determine what KP level we're at or whether or not um, whether or not we're going to be able to see, have a chance to see the Northern Lights because it doesn't factor into things like cloud cover or what the what time sunset is. Yeah, there'll be times when I'll be here and the sun is out and I'll say, hey, oh, you have a 9% chance of seeing the Aurora right now. I'm like, no, it's still sunny. <laughs> but it's kind of a good starter. And it's got a, some good information about forecasts, uh, both short-term and long-term. Now there's a local meteorologist. He actually works out at Elmendorf Air Force Base who created an app. It's called Amazing Aurora. And you can find it in the Apple Store. It's free. And this is a much better immediate, like what's going on in the next hour sort of forecast. It also reads where you are at. So it converts to local time. And it'll also tell you things about for example, right down here, um, it'll say, oh yeah, Aurora is not visible right now. Check back around 11, 10 p.m. That's when nautical twilight ends. That's the beginning of astronomical twilight. So it knows exactly based on your location when will be a good time to start looking for the Northern Lights. Of course, when you're gonna go out, you gotta know what the clouds are doing. So uh, I used to use the National Weather Service satellite imagery to try to sort of guess um, by kind of projecting ahead based on the loops, what the clouds might do. I got over that. <laughs> now I use what is called the Windy app. This thing I can scroll ahead hours or even days at a time to project what the cloud cover is gonna be doing specifically at my location. Now there are, some challenges with using this app and it's, it's still pretty accurate. I know pilots who use it to rely on when they're determining where they're going to fly. The challenge is they use more than one different model. So you have to figure out which models are most accurate. And fortunately for us, there's a tool here in Alaska we can use to cross-reference, see which one is most accurate. The FAA has a station, has stationed throughout the state, real-time cameras that show the view in all four directions at locations that are common flight routes or flight destinations for pilots. So I can look at the cloud modeling on the Windy app and cross-reference it with that website and go, okay, looking at three different points, this app, right, this mo cloud model right now is one that's the most accurate. This is the most challenging part of forecasting is the reading of the tea leaves that is trying to figure out what the heck the clouds are doing. A great website to get to know also is spaceweather.com. A lot of great information here about science of the Northern Lights, the sun, the interaction between certain types of solar activities and aurora, what's exactly going on right now, like right here. It says, this is you know from last, last year, but solar wind incoming. And say, hey, here's information. There's information coming right now. There's a solar wind. There's a geomagnetic storm on its way. It's expected to arrive, blah, blah, blah. On the left-hand side, under current conditions, it tells you what are the current solar winds. You scroll down, you'll see what's the current aurora oval, the planetary key index, and what's going on with the magnetic field. The aurora oval is just basically a 30 to 40 minute forecast that provides a probability of whether or not you're gonna see the Northern Lights in the location where you're at. On this night here, it was a very, very quiet night. You had to be in Northern Canada, Hudson Bay area 
in order to see the Northern Lights at this time on this night. Now, this was uh, so 600 UT uh, for November. That would be 9 p.m. our time here. So way too early to even try to go out for the Northern Lights. Okay, so where can I see the Aurora? The question then, if you're gonna be doing trip planning, where are good places to go? This is where I'm gonna talk about the KP index again. This is that snapshot of what the forecast looks like. The planetary K index essentially is a scale from zero to nine of how far south the Aurora might be visible. And I say might be visible because it does not guarantee it will be visible. People get all excited. Oh, there's a geomagnetic storm. We're going to go see the Aurora in Nebraska. And they go out and nothing happens. And the newspapers hype it up and everybody gets excited and they go out and nothing happens. And I'll, I'll say why nothing happens. But here's kind of a sample of what the different levels might look like. So KP2, it's directly overhead Fairbanks. KP3, it's overhead Anchorage. KP4, it's almost down to Homer. You know, KP5, it's down at Kodiak. And as you go farther east, you know, with KP5, you're getting to northern Seattle area. And here's a bigger scale of where they look across the lower 48. Now, why, why is it oval and not circular? I, I believe that probably has just to do with the magnetic field and how it, how it interacts with the northern lights. But yeah, it's uh, it's it's not a perfect, it's not a perfect circle. It's it's an oval. So when I say that the, the reason why we can't rely on the KP level, the KP level just gives an indication of how far south it may be. The things that influence the visibility of the aurora that make the aurora more active and bright is the geomagnetic field specifically. Uh, solar winds can also spark aurora, a real huge gush of solar winds up to like 500, 600, 700 kilometers per second. But consistently, the one thing I've seen is the geomagnetic field, what is it doing? And early on in that display a while ago, when there was a diagram showing the interaction of, you know, what creates the aurora, when it said interplanetary magnetic field, that is measured in a unit called a BZ. And we need the BZ to be south, I mean, way south, in order to get really active displays. If it's way north, it's basically turning the lights off. So a great illustration, a few weeks ago, there was this geomagnetic storm that hit late morning, late morning our time. All during the day, it's up to KP6, KP7. It's got a strong negative, a southern magnetic field of a negative 20 BZ, really great. And I decide, you know, I'm going to go and I'm going to get one of my bucket list shots, which is go get a photo of the Northern Lights inside a glacial ice cave. And the nearest one I know where I could do that was a five and a half hour drive one way from here. So I make the drive. I get to the location. I hike out to the ice cave about two hours before sunset. I spend six hours in the ice cave and I wait and I wait and nothing happens. Of course, I have no cell signal because it's the middle of nowhere. I get back to a cell signal, the magnetic had flipped up to a positive 25 north, which was, and it sustained that all night. I've never seen it do that in the years that I've been chasing the northern lights. So that really strong northern BZ, that northern polarity in the interplanetary magnetic field will just kill the aurora, which makes the KP meaningless. And on the flip side, I've been out in a KP zero. I've been out, you know, driving folks out on our tour and I'm watching the space weather data crash that's going from a KP three to a two to a one to a zero. And I'm like, crap. <clears throat> and then we get a great show and I look at the data and it's because we've had a strong negative Southern magnetic field, a negative seven, negative eight, and boom, sparks Aurora. So that's really what drives a good Aurora display is that geomagnetic field and particularly a southern BZ in the magnetic field. But this still gives you an idea of what you would you expect. Because when you're this far south, when you're down the lower 48, the KP does matter. You're not going to see the aurora in you know, Missouri if it's a KP 1 or a 2. But you have a chance if it's a KP 5 or a 7. 
because these are the lines of where it's directly visible overhead. So it can still be visible on the horizon if you're, say, in southern Illinois, and it's only a KP5, because that's still on the northern horizon. It would still have a chance of being visible. All right, so locations. <clears throat> there are a lot of kind of hot spots that people wonder about as being good locations to go to photograph the northern lights. You know, um, for North America, Canada, Yellowknife uh, specifically is a great spot. Churchill people go for that and polar bears. Uh, for Alaska, people, Mar Fairbanks does a great job marketing itself as the destination for Northern Lights viewing in, in Alaska. It's not, but they market it as such. And then uh, people talk about Iceland, you know, Abisko, Sweden, Tromso, Norway, all those places. What you want to do, if you're going to do, do your research and do it right, you want to see if you can find online sources that talk about the average number of clear nights per month that you're going to go. So if you're going to go in March, see if you can find out what the average number of clear nights are in March. Consistently, you'll see that locations that are farther inland are going to have more clear nights than places that are coastal. This is the one drag of being in Anchorage. We do have more cloudy skies than they do in Fairbanks. And the same thing goes with places like Tromso. I've been through Tromso, Norway twice, both times cloudy, one time snowstorm. <laughs> uh, Iceland, I went there once in early March. First night, it was clear, crystal clear, it was beautiful, got some great northern lights. And then it was partly cloudy the next night, and then it got cloudy and raining by March 4th <laughs> in Iceland. So the weather is a huge factor. Coastal areas, try to avoid, try to go inland if you want to maximize your chances. Because really, when you're planning a trip and you're planning a month's in advance, you want to maximize your chances for success. So this type of location matters in Alaska. I photographed them from the northeastern Arctic uh, coastal plain just along the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. This is near the village of Kaktovik. My absolute favorite place to photograph the northern lights in Alaska is the Brooks Range, which is our northernmost mountain range. It's entirely above the Arctic Circle. It's about, <coughs> excuse me, about a six and a half hour drive north of Fairbanks. And you definitely want to drive it. You don't want to fly in there. Um, there's a lot of great stuff to see along the way and you want to have that mobility of a vehicle to move around. I photographed it in Denali National Park. The park road is mostly closed in the wintertime, but in lower snow years you can drive up to about mile 13 of the park road. It's nice open space. Hardly anybody goes there. You've got mountains all around, so a great view. Closer to Anchorage, this is the Talkeetna Mountains about an hour and a half drive of it from Anchorage, area called Hatcher Pass. Just immediately north of Anchorage, there's a river, the Kinnick River that, that gets some open water areas in the wintertime, uh, but also earlier in the season before there's a lot of snow on the ground, you can get some cool ice reflections in other parts of the river. This is actually in the city of Anchorage right here. That's one of our neighborhoods, uh, the Potter Valley neighborhood in the photo. This is in, Trying to remember if this is it. This is in August, mid August. This is my house. <laughs> uh, this is after a long night of aurora chasing. I was out shooting for about nine and a half hours. I got home. I was dead tired. The aurora was still going. I was like, you know what? I need to get a shot of the aurora over my house. So there we go. Um, and again, this is uh, in the Anchorage area. This is uh, now I'm heading south of Anchorage. This is the mouth of the Turning an Arm, which is a saltwater body just immediately south of Anchorage. The Alaska Railroad tracks along Turning an Arm. Now this is in Iceland on the south coast. So south coast is a good place to go if you want to go to Iceland because you're, you're looking north. A lot of waterfalls along the south coast as well that you can get in your photos. It's kind of my one of my bucket list shots for Alaska is a waterfall aurora shot. As far as I know, nobody has it. This is Norway. This is one of the fjords in the Finnmark region. I was actually not there on an aurora chasing trip. I was there to photograph the Finnmark Slupet, which is their, the longest dog mushing race in Europe. It's 1,200 kilometers. And then here is uh, Sweden. 
uh, Lapland region. Now, one of the things that people often ask, do the auroras look different over in Scandinavia compared to here? And I, they really don't look different at all. What matters is who gets the leading edge of the geomagnetic storm. Sometimes it hits during our daytime, their nighttime. And so they get the really awesome, cool, multicolored, fantastic, fast moving displays. Uh, and sometimes we get lucky and it, it, the leading edge of the storm hits Earth during our nighttime. So that's really the one thing that makes a difference. All right, so photographing the aurora. Um, the biggest challenge is really focus, but I'm gonna kind of go over some basics. So I, I take two lenses when I go out aurora chasing. I'm an icon shooter, so I take my 24 to 70 f2.8 and my 14 to 24 f2.8. Now, if you get a prime, you can fudge that down to an f2 or f1.8 or 1.4. But most primes, um, the, the, the lowest you're going to get and get a faster aperture is like a 20 millimeter. And I like to have that extra space. I really do. There have been times when the 14 millimeter has not been enough. But those are really the only two lenses you need. Anything longer than that. And it's just, I've never had, a, never had an Aurora display where I felt like I needed to zoom in more than 70 millimeter. <clears throat> So focus is the big challenge. A lot of newer lenses, we, we get these uh, clients in our tours that have these newer lenses that either don't have an infinity symbol on them at all, so you don't even know where to start you know, visually, or the focus ring doesn't stop spinning. It just keeps going around and around and around. So they have to completely guess where their infinity is. Now, if the moon is out, that helps. You just autofocus, put your focus point on the moon, focus, and then switch to manual, you've now set your infinity. If you've got uh, gaffer's tape on hand, which I carry around, now it's time to tape across your focus ring so it doesn't move. Otherwise, if you're lucky enough to have an infinity symbol on your lens, start with that, take a picture. It'll look fuzzy because that right in the middle of the infinity symbol is never ever true infinity for a lens. But start with that and then move off a little bit and see if it gets better. If it does, and keep fine tuning it, take a picture, see if it's focused. If it's not, move a little bit more until you get it done. Once you've got your stars nice and sharp, then put the gaffing tape across the focus ring. Now- Can you focus the, on the horizon? Um, well, you're not gonna be able to use autofocus. So autofocus is not gonna work in dark conditions. That's been my experience. You gotta do it manually. So it doesn't, there's, you're not really focusing on anything. You're just focusing. You're starting with that infinity symbol and moving off. Now, the newer, the Nikon Z9 has a starlight mode for its live view, which I have yet to test. And that supposedly will make it easy to just do a live view manual focus on the stars or possibly even an autofocus on the horizon. I haven't tried that yet, but that's one of the things I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to play around with after our aurora season is done. I don't want to be playing around with new stuff while I'm out leading our tours because the objective is to get photos for the clients, uh, and I can play around on my own time. All right, protecting the lens is also a challenge. Uh, you may not think so, but normally where you're at, there's going to be some kind of moisture in the air. And that might build up and get a little frost on the coating of your lens. What I typically do is if I'm leaving my camera alone for a while, I just put um, a little wash, a, uh, a little rag over the top of the camera and also across the front of the lens. So that moisture isn't con growing or condensating on the lens and building up frost. Or I'm going to be just checking the front of my lens periodically and using my lens rag to wipe any frost buildup off of it. You want to take off any protective filters you might normally use, like the UV filter, because you're going to get these concentric scent. If you get an Aurora shot, you'll be like, oh, great, Aurora, boom, boom, boom. You take your pictures, and then you look in your LCD, and there are these concentric circles in the middle of your photo that are the same color as the Aurora. They're called Newton's rings, and they're caused by the light of the Aurora bouncing back and forth between the flat element of the filter and the concave elements of the lens. So take off your filters when you're shooting the Northern Lights. 
when you're taking your camera inside to a warm environment, I always just stuff it in my camera bag, close my camera bag, and then take it inside to the warm environment. Any quick temperature transitions, you're going to get instant condensation all over your entire camera on the lens, sometimes even inside the lens, how, depending on how extreme the temperature change is. So watch out for that. Uh, keeping the batteries warm is the key thing for a long night of aurora chasing. I'm going to keep extra batteries in a pocket that's inside a layer, so it's going to keep warm next to my, my body heat. Then I'm just going to pull out the cold batteries, put in a fresh one, and then warm up that cold battery. And that, that cold battery, when it warms up, is going to recover some of its charge. And again, like I mentioned before, keep it outside. If you're going to keep it outside, keep it covered. And this is really the best thing to do. If you're sitting in one location for a long period of time waiting for the Aurora, just leave your camera outside, cover it up with a rag, pull your battery out, and bring it with you into your car, your cabin, wherever you're staying, whatever it is you're doing, and then just leave it outside. Now, um, the one thing I have found that, that does happen is, uh, you know, sometimes the mechanics get a little slow, but it still takes pictures even when it's cold outside. But if you are going to bring it in, like I said, put it inside your camera bag, strap it shut, and then you can bring it in and it'll be a much more gradual warming up and you won't get condensation on your camera. So these are kind of my default starting settings for my camera when I am doing Northern Lights photography. And these are pretty good generally for astrophotography as well. So I found white balance is the most accurate but when you're shooting in raw, I mean, technically it doesn't matter. You can make more accurate adjustments when you're processing from raw. But I still like to see what it's going to look like when I'm looking at my LCD. And I found that auto white balance has the most accurate white balance and color rendition for Northern Lights photography. And I've seen this with Canon, Sony, and Nikon manufacturing. Like I mentioned, manual focus. Widest aperture you've got, open it up. You want to let in as much light as possible in order to reduce the amount of exposure time you have to have. I start out at ISO 1600, and it depends on what the phase of the moon is. I might start at 15 seconds or higher or less. You know, if it's like uh, 30, 40, 50% illumination, I might start around eight to 10 seconds. But I'm going to take a picture. I'm going to look at the exposure. Use your live, use your um, histogram because your, your LCD is gonna be deceptively bright when you're out in the dark looking at your photo on your LCD. And then uh, while you've got your image display, use your magnifying feature on the back of your lens to zoom in, look at the stars. If there are any sharp lines like a mountain or trees, look at those, make sure they're sharp and do your focus adjustments. And then you know some people like to use the long exposure noise reduction. I found that it's, um, not particularly effective. I can do just as well with any of the noise reduction tools because the other thing that happens with long exposure noise reduction is it's going to do the noise reduction for the amount of time equivalent of your exposure. So if I just did a 15 second exposure, it's going to do long exposure noise reduction for 15 seconds. So now I have to wait 15 seconds before I can take another picture. So I just, I don't use it. I do turn on the high ISO noise reduction but again, I'm going to be relying more on my noise editing tools in you know, Topaz or Lightroom when I'm doing my processing. One of the other challenges at night is uh, keeping a level horizon. Because it's really hard to really see where the horizon is sometimes. If you've got a virtual level, uh, some type of digital bubble, whatever your camera manufacturer calls, use it. I, every time I set up my camera, that's the first thing I do after I do my general composition is to put on my virtual bubble, my virtual level, and make sure that my horizon is level. Then maximize your stability. Tripod, of course. Use a cable release or a remote trigger. If you're a DSLR shooter, engage your mirror lockup because that's one more thing you can do to reduce any vibration. Also, if you have a lens that has no, uh, it has vibration reduction or you know, image stabilization, turn that off. 
because for longer exposures, that image stabilization is going to try to stabilize the image. So it's actually going to be moving and it'll cause camera movement in your photo. So you want to make sure to turn off that image stabilization. If you have it in your camera, turn that off for sure as well. One of the fun things to shoot uh, is reflections. Uh, it's one of the great options about, you know, photographing around South Central Alaska throughout the winter. There are some areas where you can get reflections. Now, normally though, the water reflection or ice reflection is gonna be about one stop darker than the sky. So there's two ways you can do that. You can put on a graduating neutral density filter if you want. I never take those with for doing nighttime photography. So the other thing I do is after I have my composition, I figure out my exposure for the sky. So let's say if my exposure for the sky for this photo is eight seconds. Now I need to double my exposure to 15 seconds. And for the first seven seconds, I'm looking through my viewfinder. I've got my glove I got a black glove on my hand. I'm looking through my viewfinder. I'm putting my hand down in front of my lens and literally I'm bringing it down to where I'm blocking off the entirety of the sky where my the bottom black edge of my gloved hand is level with the horizon. It's blocking the sky. And then I take the picture and I count 1001, 1002, all the way up to seven. And then I remove my hand. So for the first seven seconds, I'm dodging the sky during the exposure. But for all 15 seconds, the foreground is getting the exposure. So this way you get a nice balanced exposure where the foreground reflects as brightly as what it's reflecting in the sky. Any questions about that? This is great old dodging. I mean, basically it's dodging and burning, burning at the same time. I'm dodging the sky and burning in the foreground. Okay. And of course, remember that when you're doing landscape photography, you're doing composition. You got to remember composition. Uh, it's all too easy to get really excited about what's going on with the Northern Lights. You're like going, ah, Northern Lights pickers, click, 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 click. Try to think about composition, you know, leading lines, rule of thirds, uh, vary between vertical and horizontal compositions. You know, what's your focal point? Uh, and a lot of times when you're standing around waiting for the Northern Lights to go off, Look around a bit and say, okay, what would I, how would I compose this over here? If the Northern Lights were to go off here, I really like this mountain to be great if the Aurora was over here. And you kind of pre-visualize what the options are. So the Northern Lights do go off, then boom, you're, you're, you're trying to remember those elements of design while also thinking of, you know, getting a good Aurora shot. You'll see a lot of people take horizontal photos of the Aurora and it's easy to do, but a lot of times, you know, you can get great stuff vertical when you get these really tall towering formations of the Northern Lights. And again, though, you wanna think about what's your composition? How are you gonna do it? Do you have a foreground element you can include? Go through that whole thought process. The idea is, you know, do this. Uh, if you're gonna get an Aurora chasing, Maximize every opportunity, think it ahead, make sure you're ready to go, be prepared for the conditions, make sure your gear is ready, you've got enough charged batteries. And even, let's say maybe you're, you're flying somewhere, you're, you're, you're flying to Iceland for a Northern Lights trip. Um, what, look at the forecast of what the Northern Lights are gonna be doing during your flight. Cause you never know when you might get a chance to take a photo. <laughs> Now, of course, it's really challenging to get a good Aurora shot out of an airplane window because it's got to be handheld, super high ISO. Um, there's a lot of lights inside the cabin that reflect off that little bit of glass. So for this photo, I had like a coat over me that I was using as a blind to block off the light and all that. But I knew that the likelihood the Aurora was going to pop off during the flight was good. So I actually had my, my camera out with the lens, everything ready to go. I had all the settings dialed in and I was just waiting to see for them to go off. Now, if, if anybody wants to come up here sometime up to Alaska and photograph the Northern Lights with me, we've got two workshops. Um, I don't know why that's not, there it goes. 
Um, they're both in that area I told you, my favorite place to go photograph the Northern Lights up in the Brooks Range of the Arctic. This, and they're both around the fall and spring equinox. So trying to maximize opportunity for clear skies and good Northern Lights displays. So one this fall, we normally have it actually late August to early September. So we can also photograph fall colors in the landscape, but that date wasn't available this year. So we're, we're trying something different. Hopefully maybe get some snow or in this case, um, sometimes during late snow years, there's this one pond I know that gets some great methane bubbles. So that's another fun thing to do. And then we also have one in March around the spring equinox. Both of them start in Fairbanks. And then from there, we go up to the community of Wiseman, which is about a six and a half, half hour drive north. For the September one, we do one night in Fairbanks, four nights in Wiseman. For the March one, we do one night in Fairbanks, three nights in Wiseman, and the back in Fairbanks for one night. And on that last night, we do a nighttime dog mushing Northern Lights uh, experience as part of the trip. All right, so that's it. That's me with my Inupiat parka looking with Anchorage behind me in the background during one particularly nice KP4 show we had under a bright moon. And uh, anybody has any questions that haven't already been asked, now would be a, a great time. Hey, Carl. Uh, thanks for the presentation. That was awesome. Um, I was curious a little bit more about some of the compositional stuff that you talked about. Um, I, I can imagine the frustrations of being in a certain place and saying, I want to shoot a composition this way, and then the aurora ends up happening in a different place, and, and then ju just the aurora moving and changing throughout the night. So I'm curious to hear more about that. Yeah, so when you're, when you're getting on a location, um, the aurora is always going to start, and it, it depends on how far north you are in latitude as well. I've been in locations where the aurora starts to the south of me because <laughs> I was that far north. So okay. You want to know where the aurora is going to be coming from. And that's kind of your starting point in figuring out what your compositions are. But then if you get really active storms, that aurora is going to get up overhead and it's going to move south of you. So you'll want to do a 360 survey of your first spot just in case it does get that active. But you want to pick spots that are going to give you good opportunities for landscape photography. So when you get to a location, like if you're traveling to do Northern Lights shooting, you're gonna to wanna to scout out locations during the day on your own. Now, most places when you travel to, there's gonna be, you'll Google, you know, best places to photograph to, to see the Northern Lights near Anchorage, Alaska. And you'll find blogs that say, these are the places. Don't go to them. <laughs> Because everybody else to Google that will find that blog and they're going to go there too. <laughs> then you're going to be dealing with people on their headlights and their loud music and all that kind of stuff. So one of the things I, even, even though I lead Northern Lights tours and I, I chase the Northern Lights on my own, I'm not leading tours. When I travel, I take tours because I know those local guides are going to know the good spots to go and that are going to also going to be away from those crowds. Um, so scout the locations ahead of time during the daytime. And when you do that also, you can have the advantage of doing your autofocus on the horizon and then switching to manual and putting your gaffer's tape across your focus lens. You've got that done ahead of time. So you, you've got that figured out. Uh, but yeah, get familiar with the landscape, do a drive, and then try to figure out where will be some good places to start. Cool, thanks. Yeah. Sometimes, uh, back to a little bit more on the composition, so ad adapting to where the Northern Lights are. Sometimes um, you really have to adapt on the fly to what the, where the Northern Lights are. And, and in some cases, it can be kind of like wildlife photography where you, know, you have this animal and the animal's moving around and it's doing different things and you're kind of rethinking your composition based on where it's at, you know, where it's facing, uh, what, 
features might be near it, like a rock or a tree, or if there's a mountain in the background or feel the flowers. So you kind of have to be able to think on the fly about what's going to be a good composition for that subject. Yeah, I kind of expected that there would be a little bit of that element to it. So that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, it definitely is. It also made me think of a photographing cloudscapes because you can go to some place where the mountains are pretty, but you never know where the cloud is going to look good. Yeah. Yeah, you, when you're scouting, you start with locations, assuming the aurora is going to be low on the horizon. And then that way you start with a winning spot uh, away from city lights or, you know, at this location here where I'm at in this photo, if the photographer who took this picture just turns to the right about 30 degrees, they can get a shot with no city lights in it at all. So you just have to be able to find a spot where you, you won't have city lights in the photo or that might interfere with the photo in some way. But yeah, assume, assume the aurora will be low on the horizon and start that as your, your scouting point. Any other questions? How quick do your tours sell out? How far in advance would you recommend reserving? Uh, for our regular tours, because um, uh, we do a daily tour based in Anchorage, you know, peak season, February, March, they sell out quite a bit in advance. Uh, now, next season, we're going to have a second van, so it's going to be easier to accommodate more people. But you know, peak season, February, March, they sell out uh, on, you know, really good, you know, there are some days that just sell out months in advance. But for the uh, two workshops, we still have plenty of space available in both of them. What are the temperatures gonna be for those Brooks Range trips? Well, that's the nice thing about going to Brooks Range uh, at those times of year is it's not going to be 50 or 60 below. <laughs> that's January weather. So September, you know, below freezing, possibly snow on the ground, but most likely not below zero. For late March, possibly below zero, but not very much, uh, like maybe 10 below at night, but not 40 or 50 below, nothing crazy like that. More likely closer to zero. Anybody else? Okay, well, thanks everybody. Thank you, yeah. Paul. Excellent. You yeah, thank you so much. I'll stop sharing now. <laughs>